Ever felt like your players are breezing through every challenge you throw at them? You're not alone. Many GMs are finding that their games are too easy, even with the system's reputation for cinematic action and high stakes. And so here's the burning question. Is Savage Worlds actually too easy? Or are we missing something crucial when running our game sessions? Today, we're diving deep into the controversy and exploring whether the game's mechanics or our approaches are making things feel like a walk in the park. If you've spent any time in the Savage Worlds community, you've likely seen the same concern pop up time and again. The game feels too easy. How do I challenge my players? Are bennies in the wild die too powerful? Whether it's on forums, Reddit, Facebook groups, or Discord channels, GMs are voicing frustration about their players breezing through challenges and overcoming obstacles with little trouble. The standard response to this issue often comes down to a simple yet somewhat dismissive mantra. Are you having fun? That's all that matters. And while the sentiment is rooted in the importance of player enjoyment, and it is true that we should be having fun, it doesn't always address the deeper concerns that GMs might have. For many GMs, this response can feel like a band-aid solution. It overlooks the fact that GMs, just like players, are here to have fun. And when the game seems too easy, it can lead to a lack of challenge and excitement, which impacts everyone at the table. It's not about GM versus player mentality, it's about exciting triumphs or the lack thereof. So what's behind this feeling of the game being too easy. Is it the mechanics of Savage Worlds? Or is there something else going on? To understand why Savage Worlds might feel too easy, let's start by talking about the core mechanics. At the heart of the system is the target number, four. This number represents what you need to get in order to succeed in Savage Worlds. Rolling a four or higher on a single die indicates success. Let's break it down with some basic statistics. If your character has a D6 and a skill, you have a 75% chance of success, assuming no modifiers and the use of your wild die. That's pretty high considering it is only two ranks into the skill out of five, with skills going all the way up to D12. If this math seems off to you, don't forget that dice can ace or explode in Savage Worlds. And this math gets even better, or worse, depending on your perspective, when you consider the possibility of a raise. A raise occurs when you exceed the target number by four, adding extra benefits to your success. So in most cases, a raise occurs when you roll an eight. For a D6, you have a 26% chance of succeeding in getting a raise. That's a little bit better than one out of four. But it's not just about having skills. Even if you're unskilled, you're not out of luck. Rolling unskilled means that you roll a D4 with your wild die and subtract two from the result. Despite this penalty, you still have a 32% chance of success and 13% chance of getting a raise. Now, let's talk about bennies. These little tokens can be spent to re-roll dice and they significantly boost your chances of success. While I don't have the exact math for how much bennies increase your odds, it's safe to say that it makes a big difference. So whether you're skilled or unskilled, the mechanics of Savage Worlds definitely seem designed to give players an extremely good chance of succeeding in their actions. And this is a key factor in why some GMs and players might feel the game is too easy. Now that we've broken down why some people may feel like Savage Worlds is too easy, let's talk about some of the common mistakes and issues that can arise in gameplay. The first and most frequent problem is forgetting to apply penalties. Penalties for factors such as poor lighting, wounds, fatigue, and other situational modifiers are an important part of the game. Missing these can significantly lower the challenge level. For instance, a character shooting in near darkness should face a penalty reflecting the increased difficulty. Speaking of difficulty, another issue is misunderstanding difficulty levels. Savage Worlds uses modifiers instead of varying target numbers. This can be a bit of an adjustment if you're coming from systems like D&D, where you set as a GM the different DCs for different tasks. In Savage Worlds, you're usually aiming for a four, but instead of changing that number, a difficult task should be given a penalty to this role. This approach helps keep the game streamlined by allowing players to know their success immediately after rolling, but giving penalties to difficult situations can be overlooked if you're not used to it. By addressing these common problems, applying penalties and understanding difficulty levels, you can create more challenging and engaging experience in Savage Drills using the rules as designed. So what do you do? First, try to remember to apply the penalties where appropriate. Whether it's lighting, range, wounds, or other situational factors, these modifiers add layers of drama and tension to your game. Make a cheat sheet of common penalties and keep it handy during sessions. The one I use is listed down below in the description. This helps ensure that you don't overlook these penalties. When it comes to setting difficulty modifiers, it's important to keep things consistent. If you are used to using 5e DCs, here's a quick guide for converting them to Savage Worlds modifiers. If the task is very easy and extremely unlikely to to fail, but you still want to give a chance for failure via maybe critical failure, or maybe they have a lot of negatives, you can use the very easy and give them a plus four, which is a DC of about zero to five. If the task is easy, about a six to 10 DC, give them a plus two. If the task has a medium difficulty, which is about 11 to 15 in D&D, just give them a zero. If the task is a bit harder, 
give a minus two, which is about a 16 to 20 DC. If the task is very hard, give a minus four, which is about a 21 to 25. And if it's nearly impossible, give a minus six, which is about a DC 26 to 30. Now these modifiers are only trying to address how difficult it is to do the thing that they are trying to accomplish. It does not take into account other factors such as lighting, range, wounds, or fatigue. Another way you can challenge your players is to use opposed roles. Instead of a static target number, opposed roles pit the character's skills directly against an NPC's, creating the possibility of a tougher challenge. This also helps create clear impacts on the game and the story. We also need to talk about separating success from raises. In Savage Worlds, succeeding means hitting that target number of four, but according to the Savage Worlds core rulebook, a single raise always adds an extra benefit to the role. For instance, if a character succeeds in a persuasion role to convince a guard to let them pass, a raise might not only grant them entry, but also earn them a favor from the guard, such as a tip about a secret route or additional information about the area they are entering. By separating these additional outcomes, you can make it so that extreme success results in greater reward. Another way to add challenge, tension, and drama to your game is by incorporating the subsystems like dramatic tasks and social conflicts. These systems are designed to add depth and tension beyond standard encounters. Dramatic tasks, for instance, can turn a simple heist into a multi-step challenge requiring teamwork and strategic thinking. Social conflicts can bring the intrigue of political maneuvering or intense negotiations to life. By using these subsystems, you can diversify the types of challenges your players face, ensuring that each session feels fresh and engaging. Now let's talk about combat encounters and making them more challenging for your players. Obviously, one of the most important things to know is to be tactical. This can be hard to figure out when you are first starting and are learning the rules, but some examples of things things to keep in mind are, one, when a character is shaken, they can't make attacks. This includes free attacks from leaving melee. So if you go up to someone, shake them, you can then retreat safely from them, as long as you have more movement. This goes well with tip two, remember gang up bonuses. When you have a horde of monsters that can all attack one person, if the horde is smart enough, they can all then scatter once the character is shaken or worse. This helps prevent them from being taken out all at once by some sort of area effect attack and can also help pull the character into a compromising position. Or you can use this with my third tip and use opportunity of the frontline person being shaken to all gang up on the squishy character at the back of the party. Your monsters are usually smart enough to know who is going to cause problems. The person in the front with armor is going to be hard to wound, but the person in the back with the spell book, eh, probably gonna be a little easier. Also consider being transparent about enemy stats like parry and toughness. Sharing these values with your players can significantly enhance their strategic planning and make the game run a little faster. When players know what they're up against, they can make more informed decisions, which leads to more dynamic and tactical combat. For instance, if they know an enemy has a high parry, they might decide to use area of effect attacks instead or focus on boosting their individual attack rolls by using things like wild attack. Wild attack is a helpful thing for players, but it also leaves them open to a counterattack if the opposition survives. This not only makes the combat more tactical, but also more satisfying when players succeed through clever strategy. Lastly, remember to use your bennies as a GM. However, before we're thinking about those too much, one tip is actually to not use those bennies in a certain situation, which is to soak. That's not to say you should never use them to soak. You should probably use them if you need to survive. Your wild card enemies should not die with unspent bennies. But unless you must use them to soak wounds and not die, try to spend your bennies on two other options. First, if the enemies are getting low action cards and it seems reasonable that they can do better, spend a Benny to try to get a higher one in the round. This helps ensure that they get a chance to do some damage to your characters before the characters wipe the field. Second, Use your bennies to reroll attack rolls and damage rolls. Even if your players easily win this fight, giving their characters wounds will give them at least some sense of tension. At the end of the day, Savage Worlds does encourage more player success than you might be accustomed to. And that's part of what makes it unique. Embracing these mechanics can lead to a more dynamic and memorable triumphs, and maybe at least make it a little bit harder for your players to succeed and give more sense of drama. I hope these tips help you navigate the nuances of the system, point out any areas where you may have missed, and enhance your gameplay experience. If you're looking for a way to streamline your combat and keep things moving smoothly, check out this video on keeping Savage Worlds combat fast, furious, and fun.